Yeah, I don't know that you can read those numbers, but that's the current status. Only marks that are missing are assignment 7, which is with the TA. Hopefully I should get it back by today or tomorrow. I'm just a bit excited. And then the final. So uh, the last column gives you, uh, this, I mean, column R gives you your current mark out of 57.5. Those are the marks for the assignment and the final. Final is 40%. Okay. And uh, converted into percentage, and that's ranked. So the position hasn't really changed much. Okay, if you look individually. So, uh, do you want me to put this up on the model or any objections? If you don't need it, that's fine. Uh, if you want, you can come to me individually to know where you are in the class. I can show you. Uh, but that's the uh, status now. Any questions on that? I have treated the quiz as one of the assignments, uh, just included it in the 20%, equally distributed among the eight, eight assignments, seven assignments plus the quiz. Second midterm hasn't changed. I haven't changed that. Is there anything else you want me to do? The average of the second midterm and the quiz. Okay. And the quiz? Or the assi assignment? Um, I, I could do that. If that's what. It's not going to change. It's not going to change the assignment. It will bring the average up for the second midterm, a blended second midterm, but the re relative ranking will not change. Sure. <laughs> no problem. I can do that. Okay. Uh, okay. Last lecture, I spent quite a bit of time on that lab. Uh, I think it is important for um, you to be kind of exposed to answering some of the uh, problems. Uh, what I want to do is uh, the remaining time we have two lectures talk about this topic of controller tuning, what is controller tuning, and go back to control station, which I introduced uh, earlier very briefly in one of the lectures, and go through the complete process of uh, how you gather the data, how you fit the model, how you do tune the control parameters. And then uh, I have three problems that I have added at the end of this lecture notes. And uh, if there is time, we will go through these problem, just uh, outlining the solution procedure, uh, kind of a review, but, uh, starting from the basics, uh, going to all the way to uh, root locus. And so I want you to be able to be completely comfortable with the last problems, two problems that I distributed. Okay. Uh, what is controller tuning? Basically, controller tuning refers to the idea of finding the best values for the controller constant, kc, tau i, and tau d. How do we go about finding those uh, best value constants? How do we even start with an initial set of constants for a process? Okay. So each one can take a value of 0 to infinity okay, for kc, tau i, and tau d. So one of the important first filters that will tell us which regions of those k values and tau i values are not permissible would be the stability criteria. Okay. So we need to do a stability analysis. This you can do assuming that you have a model. Once you have a model, you know how to construct the block diagram, the, the characteristic equation, and determine the stability. So using the stability, you can rule out Kc, for example, cannot be greater than 25, or tau d cannot be less than 5, whatever the value is. So you rule out certain ranges of these values depending on a stable operation. That's number one criterion. The second criterion, once you are you have narrowed down the numbers, you still have a large range to search for. So you can say, okay, what else do I want my controller to do? 
I run the controller to mimic the steady state performance as accurately as possible. We already saw that if I have only proportional controller, you have an offset. Offset is a steady state behavior. So that is, the process doesn't ever get into the set point requirement that you need. So that will be the next set of guides that you would use. The steady state performance should be as close to as you want it to be. And uh, the, the last criterion would be the transient performance. So I want to get to the steady state in a certain fashion, as quickly as possible, without a lot of oscillation, things like that, qualitative quantity. So these can be quantified, and there are a lot of empirical guidelines that people have developed to initially estimate what KC and Tau and Tau D should be. And then you start with that on a plant, and as a plant operator, then you change these values by small amounts to improve the performance gradually. So that process is called the controller tuning. Okay, so I need to illustrate this with a few examples. Here I have uh, a transfer function, which is a second order transfer function with a delay. I'm not sure that you can see that. Um, so that, that is a tra process transfer function. Onto this process transfer function, I'm going to input uh, a controller and complete the block, and the block is going to look something like this. Okay. So I have the process G and the controller GC. Could be a PI controller or PID controller, and it's a feedback control system. So now that I have, I'm sitting in front of the console with the process and the controller, and I'm supposed to tune these values. That is, come up with these values for KC and tau i. Suppose I do some simulations with Simulink, and I pick KC to be arbitrary 2 and tau i to be 5. And I find the diagram that I see here okay, on the left hand side. On the top, you see the output y. On the bottom, you see the controller output u. Okay? So this is how the controller is trying to send the control signal, and the process is responding as the one that is shown in the top here. So, and we can see in the diagram, the block diagram, this is y, uh, okay. and that is u. So we're sampling u and y, and y is plotted in this one, and u is plotted in that diagram. What do you see by comparing y and u? Why is it so oscillatory? What happens to the output? When the output is maximum, what happens to the controller? It's in a minimum. So it's kind of, they're not working, they're out of sync. Okay? They're out of phase. Okay? Those, those are the terminologies that you would use. So the controller is trying to get it under control. Is it, is it a stable system or not? It is stable. Why is it stable? Because the controller action is decreasing with time, and the output also is decreasing. The amplitude is decreasing with time. So it is a stable system, but it is too oscillatory. It's not a what happens in a real plant if you have a two, such an oscillator? Whatever that is produ you're producing is going to be offset. Okay? So it's not going to be meeting the specification. Okay? So then you okay, tune the numbers to a different set, and you find uh, the diagram that is on the right. What you have been able to achieve is get rid of the oscillation. Okay? And this is trial and error, trial and error process. Um, but is this acceptable? We call this as too sluggish, meaning it takes a long time for it to get back to the steady state that you wanted. Okay? Now, in terms of the eigenvalues, this is the real part versus the imaginary part, which zone would the eigenvalues be for the left diagram? On the negative axis, but close enough to the imaginary axis. So if it is on the imaginary axis, what happens? You get a sustained oscillation forever. It will never decay. Okay? So what you're saying, this is uh, sometimes called fault placement. You want to place your roots by tuning your parameters. You want to move these roots away in this direction. Because if the real part is a large negative value, that will give you the decay, fast decay that you want. Okay. So the roots in this case are somewhere here. What about the figure on the right? Where are the roots? Okay. 
doesn't show any oscillation. So let's say if it is close to the <coughs> x axis. If there are oscillations, that means there are imaginary paths. The imaginary paths are the ones that gives you the oscillation. Okay? So in the second case, the roots are what do they do to the <laughs> closer, closer to the real axis. And it's still probably not far away because it's close to the imaginary axis also somewhere here because it is decaying slowly. And we still want it to be towards the left. So you should have this picture in your mind of where the poles are likely to be. If you don't have a model, you're just doing the test on a real plant, you're observing this kind of a behavior. These are the interpretations that you can make. Okay, any questions? And in an exam, what I'm going to do is put some sketches like this and ask you to comment on it. Okay, uh, so that you're sure that you understand the basic idea behind it. Now, in the, in the next case, I pick a different set of values for KC, 0.9 and 12.5, and I get a response that looks much nicer. Okay, so it does get to a steady state by time units of 40, and uh, there's no significant offset, and uh, that is what I mean by control of tuning to control the dynamic response. First part is the stability, the second part is a desirable dynamic response. Okay, any questions on that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, the, the reason would be something like this, right? Because you want to suppress the oscillation, you want to have a fast decay. Okay? So if the poles are somewhere there, then you get uh, a good dynamic response, stable as well. Okay? So the systematic approach to finding this is the following. Okay? So the first step is you have to identify the model. What do I mean by that? We have to have a model description so that you can have a process tensor function. What are the ways that we know? Obviously, write down the mass balance, write down the energy balance, do the linearization, get the tensor function. That's one way that we know. What would be the other way? And that's what they're talking about here. If the process is so complicated, it's a fluidized bed reactor, there are three or four reactions taking place. It's not very easy to write a mass balance, energy balance uh, for that, right? So you do a test. You do a test on the physical unit. It could be a step response test, or it could be a number of other kinds of tests. So we do a test, and we gather data from there. And suppose the data tells us that when I make a step response, the process looks like this. Then I say, OK, maybe a first order with a time delay may be a good model. So I take a transfer function first order with a time delay. And that will have three numbers in there, three constants in there. And this is where the control, uh, MATLAB can do that as well, but the control system uh, station is very handy. So it allows you to gather data online and analyze the data and fit a model, meaning get these time constants, the gain, the process time constant, and the time delay for a first order process. For a second order process, there will be more numbers like that. So this is an empirical curve fitting of the actual data that you get from a step response or a pulse response, things like that. So that is the first step. Identify the model using a number of ways. The second step would be, based on the model, obtain an initial guess for the tuning parameters in the controller. Now we have the model. We want to tune the controller parameters, k, c, tau, i, and tau, d. And there are some empirical methods that I will describe what they are. And once you do that, you tune your uh, controller to those numbers, set those to those numbers, and see how the system performs. And then you can do fine tuning meaning changing the number by a small amount. Okay, that's the overall process of uh, controller tuning. Now, in the video Nichols method, the test that you're going to do is not a step test, but it is a, what is called a continuous cycling test. It was proposed by Ziegler and Nichols in 1942. Okay, so it's primarily aimed at rejecting the disturbances effectively, and it is called an aggressive uh, controller, and we will see what this aggressive controller means later on. Okay, so, the process is the following. The process is set the integral and the derivative reaction to zero. You have only a proportional controller, and you have a real plant in front of you. Okay, you are a control engineer in charge of that. So you do a test. 
starts with a very low value of kc, okay, the, uh, the proportion of the polar constant, and then continuously increase that gradually in small steps, and look at the output, and find out for what value of kc you get continuous cycling, sustained oscillation. The output should be giving you sustained oscillation on a real plant. Okay, so you need to get permission to do this test so that you are going to lose the product during that time, but hopefully that will allow you to tune your controllers to get better uh, output on a sustained basis. Now, what, from what we have learned so far, why is this test, what is this test I'm trying to achieve? The description is you will continuously change KC and watch that value of KC that gives you output that cycles continuously, meaning an output that looks like this, as you see here. You need an output like that. You're going to increase KC continuously until you get that. That's what I want you to be able to put together with all the reason that we saw all the time, root locus, for example, and uh, we're trying to locate that point where the eigenvalues become purely imaginary. When that happens, you get sustained oscillation. And here it's a real process. I don't really know what the eigenvalues are doing, but if the response of the system is a sustained oscillation, including all the nonlinearity in the problem, okay, forget that. That means that I am close enough to the stability boundary. Okay, that is the expectation. Okay, and then I find that that k value. I will never stop that across that point. Okay, so the cross the empirical rule then says find that value and call it as k c u the upper limit, critical value for the upper limit. And also when you do the test, from the experiment, pick up the period, the peak to peak distance, okay, in time units. Okay. So P U is the peak to peak distance and K C U is the uppermost value of K at which you get the sustained oscillation. Okay. And the reason for doing that is that gives you the stability boundary. Okay. So we satisfy the first criterion if you don't cross that. Uh, so this is really a dangerous test to do if you think about it because we are close operating close to the stability limit in some sense. Okay. Um, once you have that, the video of your car is okay. If you are using only P, use 0.5 of the KCU. If you are using P and I, use 0.45 or KCU and PI over 1.2. These are empirical rules based on experience and they need not work for all the processes. The solution column may have a different dynamics than a reactor. Okay, so this is a generic set of numbers that gives you a good initial starting point, and from that point you need to fine tune that. Okay, so these tables are there for different methods, and each one goes by a different name. Okay, and there is another method, uh, Tyrius and Lubin, and it gives you somewhat less yes, question aggressive. But good question. Can you do it in a simulation? These days, maybe you can do it in Aspen Heights environment, but you have to remember that are, are the Aspen simulations good enough for the real plant? Okay, there are some differences still. Right? You do it in the simulation first, get those numbers, use that, and then try to tune. That would be a safer way because of the stability, the safety consideration. Okay. Um, because the real process is nonlinear, simulations can capture more than nonlinearity. Okay. So you wouldn't do a simulation in MATLAB with a linearized model, but already assume that you have a model for that. Right. So if you have a good model with a lot of, uh, and this this will be true for most process plans because they have in-house knowledge about the process. They collect data all the time. So they can build and fine tune a model that captures that. Process engineers use these models for optimizing the process conditions. So you can use that model with the dynamic counterpart to do this kind of test. Yeah. That would be a safer way. This was developed in the 1940s before the days of Aspen and ISIS. Right? So now the other method um, is called the Cohen and Kuhn method. And here what they do is they fit, as I said before, 
a first order transfer a function with a time delay. Now such a transfer function has k as an unknown, the gain, tau, the time constant as an unknown, and Tb or tau d, the delay, time delay as an unknown. So these are three numbers that are treated as unknown in the transfer function. Okay. Then um, you do a step test, not a sustained oscillation because that's more dangerous. So you do a step test and from the step test, as I said earlier, this is your step change and if the response is like this, you take the response and find the best values of k, tau d and tau that fits that data. How would you do that? Does any method come to your name? You must have done this in experiments and lab. Curve fitting, right? D squares curve fitting will do that for you. Okay. So D squares curve fitting to get the best values of tau k and tau d so that this model represents the data as accurately as possible. Okay. And then these guys do something clever. What they did is you give me only these three numbers that comes from real data with a step response. And I'm going to tell you what is the best value of kc, tau i, and tau d to you. So they give you a table. And the table is here. Okay. So if you are using the proportional only controller, you will calculate kc according to this formula. What does that formula contain? That formula contains the gain, the time constant, and the time delay that you fill it from the experimental data. So using these three numbers in the process, they give you uh, a good set of uh, K, K, KC values that you can use. And they have a table for PI and PID controller too. Okay? Are you following what I'm saying here? Okay? Pardon me? Oh, the first order process with time delay. First order process with time delay. The time delay simply adds the e to the power minus TDS. Without it, it's the first order process with a gain and a time constant. Okay, now how did they come up with this table? You can ask that question. These formulas look complicated. How did they come up with it? Did they write it down magically? <coughs> no. They used the second and third criteria that we need, which is uh, after stability, we need good dynamic response. Okay, so they take a graph like this. And this is a typical second order response. Okay. So here remember we talked about this idea that DK ratio is the ratio between A and C. How fast it is decaying. And um, the rise time is the how fast it is rising towards the final steady state that it overshoots. Okay. So we want a smaller overshoot, a good DK ratio, a fast rise time, and what did we call this? C F. You remember? You should review these terminologies. One qu short question with all these um, meaning of the term. The settling time or the time it takes to reach the final study state. Okay? When you saw the second order process, we introduced a lot of these terminologies. So they use these criteria. Okay? They leave uh, the KC, tau i, and tau d as unknown and try to find out what are the best values such that I have a good decay ratio. I would select arbitrarily mean maybe 70%, uh, 80%. So depending on the choice, you will have these tables changing on you. But they have made a selection of uh, the decay ratio, the right time, etc. And based on that, they tell you that you can calculate these k values, uh, k tau i and tau d according to this table. Okay. So what is the lesson from all this? You should be aware of the process, first model identification, model development, Second, stability analysis. Third, uh, controller tuning, largely empirically done. Okay. And uh, there are a lot of empirical methods that are available. Now, here is how a model fitting, I said least squares is what you would use nowadays, but before the days of computers in the 40s and 50s, this is how they would do the model fitting for a first order process with a time delay. Okay. So you do a step response and you get the data. So here is your curve, okay? And there are three numbers that we need to determine, okay? So the first number is the gain. The gain is nothing but the output to the input ratio. So you pick the last value, the steady state value, which is two in this case, 
and you made a step change of one, the unit step change. Okay, so the delta u is one, so k is two units, the gain. Okay, so that's how you get the gain in your tensor process tensor function. Then we are left with two more constants. They are the tau, the time constant, and the delay, time delay, tau d. So that means before I have a lot of data and do a least squares, I just pick two da two data points, and one I take at k three percent. And find out where is the time. That time happens to be, for example, 10 seconds. I pick another data point at 85.3 percent. Okay. Uh, I guess 33, which should actually be somewhere 70.7. This should be the one. Okay. And uh, 80, 85, 1.7. 1, 1. like so take these two numbers: 10 seconds and 26 seconds or so. Okay. And Using those two numbers, you directly calculate T, D, and tau, according to that formula. Right. In this procedure, in this procedure, that is the recipe. Okay. You do a step response, uh, get the data, and take these times. Okay. Yeah. What about the Um. No, no, the, you, it's not a result. It's a general observation for a first order process which allows you to pick the time constant directly by just one reading. Okay? So if you don't have, for example, a delay, if you had only k divided by tau s plus 1 and your response, uh, then in that case it will look like this. There will be no, the, the, the slope here will not be zero because it's an exponential. Okay, so when, when it is like that, if you go at the 66 or whatever the percentage, I don't remember, what you will get on this axis is t over tau equal to 1. That is, in one time unit, the first order process will always reach 66% of the final target. If you know, and that is always true as long as the process is truly first order. Right? If that is true, then by reading at the 66%, you can get what is your time constant. Whatever the time axis is, that's going to be your time constant directly. Okay? Am I making sense or not? Still thinking. Okay. You sh should. It is, yeah. As, as we, one of the graphs that we saw, if you remember way back, uh, when we generalized from first order to second, third, fourth, we had this graph. This was the first order. The second order will be like this, third order will be like that, fourth order will be like that. Okay? These are not pure time delay processes. This is a fourth order process, but you can approximate it as a time delay with a first order process. Okay? So the first order process with the time delay is an approximation for what really is the higher order process. And if I have to ask you about uh, does the magnitude of the time delay tell you anything about the uh, deviation from the first order process? For example, if tau d is very close to zero, this approach is very close to the first order process. So the larger the value of tau d is, perhaps it is a much higher order process without any pure time delay. Pure time delay is only type. That's the only one that gives you pure time delay. Right? So if it's a real process, but you have a tau d, and you're splitting it with a first order process that's large, it says the real process is probably a much higher order process. Okay? But you can always approximate it by a pure delay and a first order process. Okay, good question. So this recipe tells you then, do this test, take these three data points, and then estimate your k and the tau and tau d. Once you have that, put that into a table, get your kc tau i and tau, uh, tau d. Okay? That, and in this particular example, they tell you that they have done this and uh, how the pi and pid uh, controller uh, respond to a unit step change. So in the first stage, you see that you make a unit step change and it has a slight overshoot, but it comes after one cycle, it settles down. Okay? That's a good controller. And then here a disturbance comes, and the disturbance is rejected in the same way. Okay. Mm 
that's what the control control tuning idea, the concept is. It's highly empirical. And that basically, I think, concludes in terms of topics that I wanted to cover. Uh, what I will do is, in the remaining 15 minutes, I'll go through the uh, control station to show you the process of control tuning. And then I have three problems. I would like you to take a look at these problems, and we'll discuss them on Friday's lecture. If you have any questions, if you attempted by then, including the two problems in your assignment, we'll discuss all of them on Friday. Okay. So let me just start the control of station. Again, this is not related to your exam, because I'm not going to be able to ask you questions on this. But it's an important part of the course on how the data is gathered and how the control of tuning occurs. You have done this before? If you have done it, I'm not going to spend time here. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, yeah, the question, I guess, to formulate is, we have a process. Okay, we, do, we did not build a fundamental model. We are doing a test. So the question, I guess, is what model will fit the data best? Okay, because there are many types of responses. And what model will fit the data best? So you need to take a look at the data. You can do a response. The model is going to be responding in its own unique way. Whether you put, I mean, the response will be different for a step stretch versus a pulse step versus a periodic forcing. Okay, but um, uh, which test is better is more difficult to answer. I think uh, commonly it's easier to do the step response. Uh, the easiest to do the step, step uh, change. Uh, cycling requires much more uh, logistics to do the control, uh, to do the test. Uh, pulse is a bit more complicated because you need to control, bring it up and bring it down in a finite amount of time. So the step is the most commonly used one. But the response can be different. And control station tells you some of the possible responses, some of the models that are built into it. So when you start this one, you will see this case study. Let, let me open that up, and then I will continue to discuss your question. Okay. So I'm, there are many built-in models just for learning or training purposes. But it is also a real-life program in the sense you can attach it to processes. So it can gather data directly from the process. You can then analyze and tune using the tools that are here. Okay. So here I just opened up one example, which is a problem that we have already seen, two tanks in series. Okay. And there is no controller on this right now. And uh, what you see on these graphs here are actual data, simulating the actual data. If it is really connected to the plant, the data will come and you will see these charts that are going in front of you. On the top is a measured variable, and the bottom is a control variable. The controller is now set at 70% opening for the valve, for example. So I can go and change this to 80%. That's that change. Okay, I've changed the control valve. And look at how the process responds on the top. It is this response I need to use to see whether a first order with a time delay will be adequate, or do I need a second order or a third order. Okay? So that is going to depend on the uh, process. So if I take a distillation column, I may not get the same response. It may actually go down and up. Okay? Sometimes it's called an inverse response. Then you need a different type of order model. So then looking at the data, you have to decide what type of model will be best for the particular process. So the first process is, you, you have a real process here, we're simulating it, and we're doing some tests, looking at the response, and trying to decide what kind of model I should pick. Okay? So it allows you to save the data, whether it's coming from real plant or when you're doing a test. So we're simply opening up the save, and I'll just put it into a final call test. Okay? And it, it is how, how frequently you want to sample it, every ninth point. And if this, the, the constant data are going into the file now. I'll bring it back to 70%. Right now, it's capturing the data into the file. Okay? And uh, you can stop the saving by going and uh, clicking there. So you are collected the data. Okay? The next step would be to build a model for that. Okay? So you can go into the design. And here, 
you see on the bottom, I'm sorry, this is, I cannot really blow this up because it's a fixed size, I think. Uh, a first order equation with a time delay on the right hand side. Okay? And in the Laplace domain, it's the first order transforming function with the time delay. Now, you can select different models. Okay? So, this is, I think, should answer your question. If the response, for example, is like this, then first order process with the time delay would be a good uh, model to capture. Meaning it will have only three parameters that you see here, kp, theta p, and tau p. Now, integrating. So if the response, for example, you make a step change, and the process output comes like this. If the output is like this, then it is, it is a first order process that is integrating. Okay? So the equation is dy dt equals k times u times c minus theta p, just a pure delay. And the transfer function will be something like this. That model will be better. So to answer your question, I need to look at the response and see which model will be most suited for that. Now, there are obviously millions of models, okay? So all this tool gives you is a few set options, few set options. So if it is a, something like this, then a second order model with the time delay. Second order model with lead time. So if you see some sort of a decrease and then increase, maybe this model may be better. It looks much more complicated, okay? But this data, can be fed into this program, and the program can fit the model and give you all the parameters. In this case, for example, you have kp, tau l, theta p, tau p1, tau p2. There are five constants. It will give you the best value of those five constants. Then you can use that model to do the controller tuning. Okay, so this is the model building step. Okay, is that clear? Does that kind of answer your question? I think that is your question, right? How do you, what, what is the, no, your question I guess is what is the best test to do? Okay, okay. Okay, so first order, uh, so let's just pick uh, first order process with the time delay. And then um, start fitting. Okay. No data selected, I guess we must select data first. Okay. So we can, there, there are a lot of options here and it's kind of intuitive um, just how to play with it. So this is the data that we have captured for that particular period of time when we did the step response. And you can, for example, this is, uh, allows you to trim the data. If you don't want the data all the way going up to there, you can say trim it and then save that data, save it in a different file if you like. Okay. And uh, then you can close this. And now start fitting. So there it gives you a fitted curve to the data. Okay? And it gives you on the bottom green line the gain 1.136, tau 1.67, and theta the time delay. And it gives you the R squared error because it does a least square curve fitting. So it gives you the error between the measured data and the error curve. The error curve, the measured data, you don't even see it. Why? Because it's such a good trick. Right, right, right on top of that. Of course, I say, no, I don't want this. I want to have a smaller time delay. I just keep decreasing it. Okay, you see that the error goes up. And the error curve now departs much more from the blue curve here, right that you cannot even see there. <laughs> uh, but you, you must play with it. Okay? But if I change the gain, for example, Now you see the data there, real data there, and the actual, uh, the perfect one there. So you can change visually if you want to numbers that are different from the best set. Okay? Once you do that, uh, those numbers are entered into the uh, controller here. Okay? The gain, the time the constant, and the time delay. Now you choose PI. It says these are the best control actions, KC and tau I. How did it come up with that? It probably used one of its own tables, either the regular Nichols or the Kuhn Kohen, whatever it is. Okay? So it uses those to get the best initial value for uh, KT and tau. That's, that's the process of tuning. This is very close to what you will see in a real plant. Okay? The control station is a pretty good uh, simulation of the environment with the ability to actually uh, directly interface with the plant. Okay? Any questions on that? Now, how do I enable the controller? So I just go and click on this, 
and right now it is in manual mode. Okay, so I just say CID. Then now you see the loop completed. You have uh, no control over the controller output anymore. It's grayed out. But what you can do is you can do the set point. Previously you didn't have that. Now you have the set point. So if I change the set point to three, it should then send the signal to the controller to adjust the control output. So what you see in the bottom is the control output changing with time uh, for a step change in the height and how the system actually responds to the top. It's actually a nice program, except the black box program, I'm a bit hesitant to use in teaching because you don't know what, how we'd be doing all these things. Okay? But it is very close to what you will be facing in real life, so it's a useful exposure to this kind of an environment. But in MATLAB, you actually do it, so you understand how, how it is done. Any questions or comments? Okay, so that's basically all I wanted to show you on control station 10, 15 minutes introduction through this process of controller tuning. Okay, so you should have an idea of what controller tuning is. And the tables and stuff I'll put in the following sheet. So if I ask you to, for example, recommend a value of uh, KI, KC, or tau I, you should be able to follow that up. That will be part of the exam uh, set as well. Okay. Controller tuning. Very simple question. Straightforward number of questions. Okay. Yeah. Now that we have this theoretical model, if we generate the values, this is a theoretical model. So basically, you just have a little bit of a change. It's a little bit of a change. It's a little bit of a change. Yeah. So why is it a little bit of a change? Good question. They added, yeah, they added that in for realism, okay, by just putting a, generating a random number with controlling the random number uh, amplitude. Okay, so just to, but that's how realism is, so, so it's not um, the random number that you see is uh, not part of the model. It's added in afterwards. What you're talking about these fluctuations? Yeah. Uh, those, those are simulating the real fluctuation in the signal. Oh, you're going to fall down. <laughs> okay, so it's not part. Of, this is a deterministic system, so it's not part of the. But if you have. Okay, so take a look at those three problems plus the two in your assignment and bring back your questions. If you have no questions, I'll just go through discussing uh, how you would. And that covers, I think, the entire part. So a quick tip open the questions will be based on a linearization. So all of you did very well in the quiz, so uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm uh, confident that if you do as well in the final as you did in the quiz, on that part, you should be able to pass. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 